welcome back to this other moment, privileged moment of this wonderful conference, which is to actually hear both uh, Rolf Hoyer and Joishi Ito, who have some of the most tangible positions in this present time. Uh, Rolf Hoyer is general director of the CERN and has been so since 2009. And Joishi Ito has been uh, named recently director of the Media Lab uh, at MIT. I'll start with Joy, because I've known Joy for a long time, and I can say a few things. We met here, in fact, uh, in 1994 at the jury of Art on the Net, and we've become friends since, and I have been able to follow his extraordinary career <laughs> since that time. And I can call him an NBI, a natural-born innovator, even though he doesn't like the word innovation. Uh, Joy, my first question is to you. MIT, uh, the Media Lab in MIT must be in deep trouble if they have taken you as a director. <laughs> No, now they're in trouble because they have me as a director. Um, <laughs> um, and I didn't say I didn't like the word innovation. I was actually, that was a question that we were discussing. Um, and I think we, at the breakfast table, we came up with a semi-conclusion that at least in Europe, it was discontinuous progress. Whereas in some places, in com corporations, innovation sometimes means incremental um, transformation. And so there was a discussion at, MIT, at the Media Lab about whether we should be using the word innovation. But, but. Um, but I do think that um, it was an unusual choice. I was quite surprised. Um, to be, yes, how did it happen? Um, so I was uh, uh, doing my search and recovery training in a dry suit in Canalita on the island diving. Um, and Nicholas, I talked to Nicholas Negroponte on the phone. And uh, he suggested that um, I should think about the position. And I was obviously quite surprised. But I wanted to see what it was like, and I visited. And once I visited and did this kind of almost like speed dating, met students and faculty all day long for two days. After the two days, I was completely convinced that this is exactly where I wanted to be. Yeah. You mean to say that to becoming an administrator? Well, it's, um, administration is part of the job. But you know, I, I, I had lived my life kind of vicariously through academics. I, I love to connect people and things together. Things that aren't supposed to be connected together are the things I like to connect together the most. And what I found at the Media Lab were you know, hundreds of people, all completely different, all working together. And just about every single thing that I was interested in that everybody called me scatterbrained for all had somebody in the Media Lab that was doing that. And so I found a place that suddenly turned this completely unfocused sort of interested in everything life that I had into a very focused one. And, uh, and, and just having turned 45, I felt like finding a home for all of these things was exactly the right time. So what's the agenda? The agenda, well, this is a, that's a long, longish <laughs> thing. Going. But, but um, <clears throat> you know, so I've been, I've been talking with Nicholas a lot. And um, so this is all actually not, this is, uh, we were on the record, but, um, but we're, we're going to make a lot of changes. So we're going to change the mission statement to be more about open. We're going to we're going from a container mode to a platform mode. I mean, I think that you know the Media Lab was started 25 years ago before we had the internet, and so this is the PC revolution. This is a digital revolution. This is about new man-machine interfaces, about the mouse, about Windows, about conversions. And so what was happening back then was in, in the Media Lab's contribution to the P, the personal computer and all of that was extremely important. But I think that the world has now shifted its focus to networks and to ecosystems. And products and things don't happen in isolation as much as they used to. I think there's less focus on IP and more focus on ecosystems. And so I think new words will be things like platforms instead of containers, open instead of closed, uh, distributed. Um, you know, even if you look at um, brands like TED, you know, they used to be these kind of cathedral brands of like these experts meeting somewhere far away, doing something tremendously interesting and important. But now, TED, you see it's everywhere. The videos are everywhere. They use Creative Commons licenses. And so I think that trying to involve more people in the Media Lab and having the Media Lab involved in more things, but at a very kind of network level rather than at a high level. In, I mean, institutional relationships are important, but I think the, really the things that matter are going to be the things that are kind of much more um, decentralized. Rolf Heuer, um, you were talking this morning about uh, a difference between the definition of innovation in Europe and in the US, and in fact, there was something to do with uh, qualitative 
change in innovation. CERN is certainly known for not only fundamental basic research, but also a lot of spin-offs and, and things. Can you tell us a bit more about this innovation pattern that you see in CERN? Well, first of all, I, we met the first time this morning right. at breakfast, both of us. And I must say, we resonated quite well, Joey and, and, and myself. I must say, what, what Joey just said about openness, get away from the silo thinking, get more platform networking. This is exactly, I think, what we have to do. Um, and what we both like to do. So I think the, he spoke exactly what, how I would have spoken. Now, concerning innovation, I think in Europe, at least, as far as we understand it, as, as far as we define it, it is progress for example, in technologies or whatever, in a non-incremental way, yeah? And that's important. I mean, and you have to give a, the freedom to the people to do that, but you have to, to also focus them at the same time, because if you give them too much freedom, I don't think you get much innovation out of it. You get essentially chaotic things out of it. But if you have some focus on a target, but leave the people freedom to reach that target, to develop the new technologies, then you get innovation. Let me just come back to what Joey just said on the internet or on the World Wide Web. I mean, it was not for nothing that this came out from CERN roughly 20 years ago, the World Wide Web. And frankly speaking, if you look on, on uh, well, nobody will ever look too much detail in, into the software, but if you look at the HTTP backslash backslash uh, column, that can only come from a physicist. I mean, uh, this is uh, <laughs> quite obvious, yeah? Um, but why did it come? It came because we needed a platform to distribute information, to have access to information worldwide because our experiments became worldwide uh, endeavors. And this is how the web was born. And it is a perfect example of innovation because the, the, the group leader of Tim Berners-Lee at that time, he got the proposal from Tim Berners-Lee on his table. He looked at it and his conclusion was vague but exciting. <laughs> okay, fine. And it has changed our life. Yeah. Now today, I mean, now we are doing, look at this uh, logo here. This is from CERN. This is... Uh, how we visualize the, the results of the collisions at the Large Hadron Collider, which I think was presented yesterday uh, um, in quite detail. Mm -hmm. We now today produce per year 15 petabyte of data. 15 petabyte of data, if you would store it on CDs, it would be a tower of 20 kilometers height. You cannot do that at a single uh, computing center. So now today, from the web, we make one step further to the grid computing. That means from information exchange to computing power distributed all over the world. That's the next step. Maybe it will change our life again. Maybe not as much as the World Wide Web, although you have already debated this this morning. But again, I think this is a step in innovation. Yeah. So this is fantastic. And OK, it's just fascinating. What are the priority questions now at, uh, at CERN? Well, here, origin, how it all begins. Yeah. That's the question we are addressing. Yeah? And again, the fascination is we are addressing it. We find some answers to the questions. Yeah? And then by finding these answers, that means by opening the door to these questions, we come into a new room and suddenly we find other doors, other questions, deeper questions. And then we have to work in order to open these doors and in order to, to answer these questions. Some people think it's, well, it's boring or it's not satisfying. I think it's fascinating to learn something and then to have new questions. And again, we have quite a lot of similarities here. We are talking about, uh, okay, that's a different story, but how it all begins and how it changed because at the beginning there was matter and antimatter created within the same quantities. Today, we are in a matter-dominated universe. So where is all the antimatter gone? That's one of the questions we are addressing. Another question we are addressing, it took us three, four, five decades to describe the visible world. Now, this visible world is less than 5% of the whole world. We don't understand 95%. 
And today we are addressing the question of these 95% of the so-called dark universe. Even an old guy like me can get very fascinated about that. So, so I, I, I find it fascinating that, uh, that you have the questions, because I think that's one of the biggest differences between our institutions, because we're really looking for the questions. You know, we, we don't have, I mean, so we're very multidisciplinary and we're very similar at many layers, but the one big difference is that you have a big question and then you have, uh, or questions, and then you have this multidisciplinary support. You know, we, we have a bunch of answers, and we're looking for the big questions, you know, and, and our search space is, 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 our search style is slightly different. I think we have a perfect symbiosis between us, yeah? <laughs> so I, <laughs> I think we should try to work more together, huh? Yes, what absolutely, about yes, yes. <laughs> so that's the other difference. There is one difference between both of you in that the multidisciplinary is, an, is a natural thing. Uh, uh, in your case, they're all out one pl in one place, right? All the people well, are there. Yeah, I mean, so, so I think that the, 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 you know, the, the way that we try to deal with, because there's a fine line between serendipitous and random. And I think that, you know, Rolf is saying random isn't useful, but it's, it's important to kind of have a general trajectory of where you're going. So we are all kind of headed in the right direction. But if you put everybody in this space together, you provide them with the tools, which are you don't have to write that many papers, you focus on building, you're supposed to work with each other, we have big ateliers with glass windows, everybody can see what everybody else is doing, and then you let serendipity happen, right? And, and it's really about embracing the serendipity. We have you know, 300 projects and uh, 25 faculty and 140 students all interested in different things, but we're kind of able to then turn that into actual stuff. And, and the stuff heads, not all the stuff's important or interesting, but a lot of it is. And, and I think the, the, the trick is to how to tease out the useful serendipitous events from those things that are random and to try to have this kind of internal compass which tells you the direction you're going instead of a map. Because if you plan everything, you can't get lucky. And you have to, you have to get lucky a lot. Indeed. And that's part of your job, yeah? To, to really f uh, select the right things, yeah? Yes. Not, not to be favorite of one or, or the other one, but really to select the direction. In our case, we have the direction, and my job is to keep the people focused. Mm -hmm. yeah? mm -hmm. In interdisciplinary collaboration happens naturally in the, in, at the Media Lab? Well, I think it happens... Well, we, we have a lot of parameters that cause it to be more likely to happen. We, we only hire one of any kind of faculty, so you never get these groups. Um, we, we encourage it, um, and because it's a build culture, so I think it's very difficult for a physicist and a uh, architect and an artist to have a verbally rigorous argument. Mm -hmm. But it's very easy for them to build something together and then point at it. And this is also part of our, our roots from the School of Architecture, which is about you build something in the atelier together, and then you can argue about this thing. And it's easier to argue about something that you've built. And it's also less personal, because if you're attacking somebody personally, you be it becomes an argument. But once you've sort of created a thing, an artifact, you can talk about it. So a lot of the students, and we have a tremendous capability to build. We have this wonderful class that Neil Gershenfeld teaches called How to Build Just About Anything. <laughs> and so we can build little nano devices, we can build cars. And so you'll see these students in the cafeteria hanging out, talking about stuff, and then, and then they'll stay up all night and build it. You know? and, and so that build culture, I think creates a certain kind of rigor around a multidisciplinary environment that you can't get if you're focused too much on academic paperwork and, and on referencing, because everybody brings all, all the baggage of their academia with them, whereas at the media lab, it's, it's kind of discouraged. Both of you have... Sie beide haben ja das Privileg, dass wir auch hier haben, nämlich mit wichtigen Leuten zusammenzukommen, mit interessanten Personen. Sie haben von einem gesprochen, Ed Beuden, könnten Sie darüber noch etwas sagen? Ja, das war ein Beispiel. Wir haben äh, 25 Professoren, Ed Beuden. Äh, ich, ich habe kein Lieblingsprojekt, da bin ich sehr vorsichtig. Aber Ed Beuden ist ein Professor, der auch Bergsteiger ist. Der hat äh, durch Erfrierungen seine beiden Unterschenkel verloren. Und äh, sie mussten ihm amputiert werden. Er hasste Krücken. Und er unterrichtet Biomechanik im Lab. 
Das ist Ed. Es ist ein Hightech-Projekt. Er musste die Fortbewegung with servos um, and had to understand um, and we're working on a, lo a lot of different things like how nerves can um, grow into muscles to move uh, things, how to grow nerves into skin to sense uh, the bottom of the foot and uh, I guess the video is not going to work. It's showing down here but I guess. Anyway, so he's, he's got I... a nearly normal gait now. Um, and we're working on knees. Um, but what's interesting is it involves sensors, it involves um, electronics, it involves battery technology, it involves all kinds of disciplines to get this to work. And the focus of answering this problem, how do we make him walk like a normal human being with no crutches, then spins off a bunch of technology that can be used in other projects. Including sensory relationship to the prost prost yes, prosthesis. Yes, so it turns out that if you, the cells, uh, the further away you get from the spine, will uh, regenerate and they will grow back into tissue. So we've already started demonstrating the ability to move things based on um, nerves um, that have grown into new muscle and to sense things. So hopefully by the end of our pro program, he'll be able to feel the bottom of his feet and, and, and move more um, with his nerves. Him and many other handicapped people. Yes. No, I think that's fascinating to see that. And it also shows what a determined mind can do. Yeah once you also have the means, again, the freedom, and that is part of your job, to, to give him that freedom and to give him the means. And it's very similar to us. I mean, our guys are developing things, I mean, not immediately like this, but if you look now on uh, PET and MRI, it, there was a very nice symbiosis between med medical and, 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 and med med between medicine and, and, and uh, physics, yeah? I mean, developing our instruments in order to address these questions of the origin. You can use these instruments, these detectors, also in the, in the hospital. And this is a virtuous circle between uh, basic science developing uh, instruments, detectors, in order to use it also in the hospital to detect the signals from PET. And also, for example, combining it with MRI, that means have these sensors insensitive to magnetic field. Yeah, so can, you can use it there. So we are working together also with hospitals. We are doing basic science, but we are also working together with hospitals in order to develop further the application in, medic in, in, in medicine. Absolutely. Well, that's, uh, um, I'd like to let the public ask questions as well, but I have one more for Joy. Um, you've long been an advocate of open source and of open systems. Matt, now you're talking about something I had never heard before, which is open hardware. Can you tell us a bit about what that means? Yeah. Well, so, so, so CERN is leading it. Uh, are we, you leading we, that? We, we started well, we are participating. It, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so we, 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 part of it was started at, with Creative Commons, but a group of people got together to um, define the open hardware um, definition and CERN is now creating a repository and, and, and leading the, the license around it. But, the, but, but it's, it's basically open source for hardware. It's mm -hmm. a little more complicated because it involves patents and involves a lot of new things. But, but now with the manufacturing becoming very rapid and the ability to fabricate things, you know, this network of ha hacker spaces where kids are building ha hardware. And I think that a lot of the key elements around innovation, I'll use the word innovation, in software came from lowering the cost of failure by lowering the cost of production distribution. Mm -hmm. Similarly, the lowering the cost allows you to take more bets. And so with hardware right now, the cost of innovation is so high. And I think open source, open hardware, more than anything, will just you know, explode in terms of innovation with the, the decrease in the cost of, of trying new things and sharing. That's a sharing. That's the point. It's a sharing, and it's fascinating to see that also the private enterprises are buying into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that it really works. How do both your centers deal with intellectual property? Is there a great deal of protection of it, or is there a great deal of openness to that? The latter. We, are, we have a great deal of openness. After all, we are uh, funded by public funding, so everything is open, and we have very little uh, patents or licenses, etc., because everything is published. And uh, I'm personally a great fan of open data, open access, everything. We are now also trying to transform uh, the way of the public. The publications are done. That means that uh, the libraries have to 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 uh, buy the the, the journals, etc. Now we want to go to open access so that everybody has access to the publications, and it's 
at the origin it, it, is, it is paid for it. The funding comes at the origin and not at the end user. Well, I wish that was the case for every publicly funded operations. Is it the same model with you, or do you well, have more American type of control? Well, <laughs> um, it's, it's a little trickier for us, yeah. because um, although MIT is mostly government funded, the Media Lab is corporate funded. Ah, so we're 85% funded by corporations. And so in our agreement, we have this thing where all of the members of that participate share the IP. I've, I, I'm going to blog this today, so it's not public yet, but um, I'm creating an IP commission um, chaired by Lawrence Lessig, and we're going to populate with a diverse group of people to review our IP policy, because I do think that in some cases it gets in the way, and so we'll figure out a way to navigate it, because for instance, you know, Hugh Herr, who you just saw, he has, a, he requires a certain amount of patents, and then Ed Boyden, who works on medical um, discovery, it's a very different patent area than, say, people who are working on open hardware. And so we may, we may have to have a little bit more complexity than completely open. But, uh, um, but complexity and intellectual property are things that, that I think um, you can handle. I, I, now I, can I, see I enjoy. <laughs> I can see why they hired you. And I can see why Negro Ponte who sort of needed some counterbalance there. So that's wonderful. Well, maybe there are some questions from, uh, from the public. And then uh, there is one right there. So you have to bring a... Yeah, it's a question for Joshi. Um, in this, uh, we, uh, I was at a conference um, of the space industry uh, when I saw an example of some very interesting innovation with space tethers um, blocked by um, the failure to grant an export license by the State Department. Do you, in this wonderful picture of, in, of worldwide collaboration, do you think that we're going to get into the area of protected technologies, particularly technologies developed at MIT, for example, that may have military or strategic significance? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's obviously tricky for MIT in a variety of ways, because I'm not a college graduate. I'm a Japanese citizen. They've got lots of government contracts. And so, so, so these, are, but these are all great questions to challenge. And um, the great thing about Open is, um, so I'm on the board of the Mozilla Foundation, and I've worked a lot in open source. And once you make something open source, under the US export stuff, it's usually treated as free speech. And so we can actually ship Firefox with cryptography and everything to Syria because it's classified as free speech. And so, so this is another reason to make things open because then it un it, it's tricky. You know, and, so I, and I'm not a lawyer and all the caveats here, this isn't You have a lawyer's blessing, though. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, um, and, and it's complicated. But there are ways to work around a lot of these export things. And most of the things, as long as you have a will, there's a way. And I think the first most important thing is for the whole institution to focus on the idea which is that we want to get our stuff everywhere and that intellectual property should be used to enable things to be more open rather than enable things to be more closed. And once you have that basic compass, then I think the lawyers start pointing in the right direction rather than the wrong direction. And, and this is also something that we'd like to infect corporations with as well because I think that corporations, I mean, it's in their best interest to understand that openness is the competitive position. I think it's important to So, so, so this is a, in U.S. Um, uh, copyright stuff. It's a very important to um, change to understand the difference between plagiarism and copyright violation, because plagiarism, not giving attribution, is not always illegal. So you have an, you could fair use. I could quote you and not give you attribution, and it's not illegal, but it's unethical. Whereas copyright violation, like I take a picture of Mickey Mouse and I draw it on my paper, on my pad, that's not unethical, but it's illegal, right? And so, so, <laughs> so I think it's very important to just make a distinction. And yeah. so thinking about, and this is a key thing about Creative Commons with our CC0, which is we're telling people, for instance, with our project SafeCast, all our data is made public without any kind of copyright um, at all, but we are asking for normative um, attribution. And so this is very different than, than trying to enforce it as law. And I think the norms are actually stronger. Social norms are stronger than law because law is, is, is not very flexible. One more question there. Uh, 
Well, um, I'm, I'm not a physician or not inside of so much in technology and so on. I'm just a simple designer. But um, I'm, I'm fascinated with uh, a new technology and uh, future thinking. Um, and it, what it brought me here mainly was because um, of thinking about how to understand and, and, and have the belief that we can understand how this all started, the Big Bang. And my question is, is for you, Rolf. Um, can I still believe um, by having this uh, gigantic, large accelerator uh, instrument that all those people that they are, um, those laboratory people that they are, different ones, all of them uh, investing on trying to find so, uh, um, answers. Um, all those answers, they're going to help us to um, face a, a quite interesting future like replicators or beaming possibility. Um, on, on a very further future, perhaps. So beaming matter or, or replicating food or water. Uh, can we think that or it's really silly of me? <laughs> <laughs> I think nobody will prevent you of thinking of that. <laughs> and I encourage you to think about that, but to realize it, I have my hesitations. Maybe I'm not innovative enough. Uh, I see it very, very, diff uh, very, very difficult, and certainly not in the next lifetimes. But one has to be very careful with, with predictions, because uh, if I if I remember if I remember correctly, several decades ago, the boss of IBM, when they created the first mainframe, he said the world will need only one or two or up to five of these mainframes. And I think he has proven himself very, very soon afterwards as completely wrong. I don't think I'm completely wrong, but it will take a long time, and I myself don't think it will bring us into that direction. But it will help us to understand better the world around us, to understand better how, well, I repeat again, how everything began. And this is something, I think, if we stop addressing these questions, we stop thinking large and thinking in, 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 in big terms and if we don't think in big terms I think we lose a little bit to be humans as we are now and we should also not forget that out of these things a lot of, the, a lot of applications come. When Dirac 80 years ago, a bit more than 80 years ago, Paul Dirac, a famous theorist, he was forced to introduce antimatter as a theoretical concept. A few years later it was, uh, it was discovered and today you use it in hospital. Yeah? PET, the positron emission thermography, P, the positron stands for the anti-electron, it's an antimatter particle. He would not have uh, foreseen that, yeah? But beaming, no, and I wouldn't like to be beamed, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, suppose, he would, suppose Joey would be beamed and he would come out like me. He wouldn't like it. He wouldn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> Beam me up, Rolf. <laughs> okay, um, I, this was an actually a lovely conclusion sentence, what you said, because uh, thinking in large measures is really fundamental, and I think it's a wonderful suggestion. I love Ars Electronica, and it does everything well, but in this case, I'm quite angry because we only have half an hour with this uh, exp very privileged moment. I want to thank Rolf Herr and Joichi Ito for a fabulous moment of interaction with us. Thank you very much. <laughs>